In this video, I'm going to cover complex ion formation. So um, transition metals, the cations that they create, tend to be good Lewis acids. And we talked about Lewis acids and bases a bit um, in, our, in the first term back in chapter four. Um, but remember, a Lewis acid is an electron pair acceptor, and a Lewis base is an electron pair donor. Um, so they're similar to Bronsted acids and bases, which are trading H plus around, right? An acid donates an H plus and a base accepts it. Um, a Lewis acid accepts electrons from a Lewis base. So they're very similar ideas. Um, but generally, when we're talking about Bronsted acids and bases, we're always talking about H plus. When we're talking about Lewis acids and, and bases, we're talking about uh, different compounds that can accept the electrons. So um, these metal ions, transition metals, uh, when they dissolve in water, they are generally, they don't just float around as free ions. So for example, if I dissolve silver chloride in water, we've before shown that the silver and the chloride break apart and Ag plus floats off on its own and Cl minus floats off on its own. And so I have a solution full of Ag plus ions and Cl minus ions. Well, sometimes that's not necessarily true because once the Ag plus separates from whatever its ion is, Cl minus or, or nitrate or whatever the, count, the anion is, once this Ag plus is by itself in water, it actually reacts with the water itself and creates something that looks like this. And it creates something that looks like this, where a silver ion has coordinated with, in this case, two water molecules to create what looks like a new ion, right? So the silver, the point is, this silver ion does not float around by itself, Ag plus. It floats around accompanied by these two water molecules, and it creates a whole new compound, a new uh, structure that we call a complex ion. Notice that water is neutral and this cation has a positive charge. So when they're added together, the whole species still has a positive charge because the neutral water doesn't do anything to change the charge of the, of the cation. So when we have this kind of structure where an ion that's dissolved in, in water can coordinate with other molecules, in this case water, but it could also be other molecules, we call those complex ions. And the, uh, the molecules that get attached to the central metal ion, these are called ligands. So just to refresh, a Lewis acid is an electron pair acceptor. So here we have um, So here we have. Uh, F minus a fluoride anion that has four pairs of electrons and it can use two of these electrons to kind of reach out and make a bond here with B. Uh, boron only has two, four, six electrons in this case and remember for boron that's normal. Boron usually only has six but it also means that there's room for two more because remember that that shell can hold eight electrons, the octet rule. So boron generally only has six, meaning it has room for two more. So if F minus gives two of its electrons to boron, we can create this bond right here. Notice that I had a lone pair of electrons on the fluoride, and that lone pair of electrons has now become a bond between the boron and the fluorine. So this kind of bond is a uh, covalent bond. Remember, covalent bond is when both atoms share the electrons. So this is a covalent bond, just like these are all covalent bonds. But this is a different kind of covalent bond because remember, generally when I'm creating uh, Lewis structures and I'm looking for bonds that share electrons, well, the boron brings one electron and the fluorine brings one. The boron brings one and the fluorine brings one. The boron brings one and the fluorine brings one. So that boron brought three electrons into this molecule and each F also provided one electron, half of the bond, right? Well, in this case, the boron doesn't have any electrons to give to make this last bond. F has two extras, and boron has none. So both of the electrons in this bond, both of them came from fluorine. Not, 
not just one of them, as in these other bonds. So these are, are true, pure covalent bonds, but this bond, we call this a coordinate bond or a dative bond, because rather than each element providing one electron to the bond, which is typical, the F provided two and the B provided none, but I still have a covalent bond there. So the F minus is considered a Lewis base because it's donating a pair of electrons. And the B is considered a Lewis acid because it's accepting that pair of electrons. So um, F minus can be a Lewis base, or F minus could be a Bronsted base, right? We can draw this same picture. Let me put the lone pairs in here. We can draw this same picture, and F minus is going to reach out and grab H, right? In this case, if the thing that's being attacked is H plus, then that's called a Bronsted acid. It is technically also a Lewis acid in that it is accepting a pair of electrons from F, just like B is accepting a pair of electrons from F. But this is a special kind of acid that we call a Bronsted acid specifically, H plus. And F minus in this case would be considered a Bronsted base because what it is grabbing, what the base is grabbing is H plus. So the very uh, presence of H plus in this reaction makes these Bronsted base and Bronsted acid. Whereas if I just change this to another complex that can also accept electrons, now this is a Lewis acid and this is a Lewis base. So F minus, depending on the situation, is a Bronsted base and a Lewis base. Depends on what the situation is. Okay, so complex ions involve um, a, a central metal ion, which is typically a transition metal. Al aluminum 3 plus is actually not a transition metal, right? But we have like copper and silver and chromium, and generally those transition metals are the ones that are uh, the central ions for complex ions. Not always, in this case, obviously, aluminum. So we have a Lewis acid that will be attacked. It will accept electrons. And we have a Lewis base that will do the attacking that will donate the electrons. So in this case, I had one central ion and six water molecules. One, two, three, four, five, six. All six water molecules around the central ion. So what this means is that when I dissolve aluminum in water, let's call it aluminum chloride or aluminum nitrate or whatever it happens to be, when, it sep when the aluminum 3 plus separates from its anion and it dissolves, it is not by itself. It doesn't float around in the water as Al3 plus. It's just one sphere, right? So it's not just like this sphere of Al3 plus is floating around. That sphere of Al3 plus is also surrounded by six water molecules that have a very specific structure and geometry. They're not just gr crowding around the Al in any position. They take very specific positions, and they ha these are actually covalent bonds. So this, rather than being Al3 plus floating around by itself, this whole giant sphere floats around. And this is what happens to the aluminum 3 plus when it's in water. It starts to float around as particles that look like this. So this is called a complex ion. And again, you can see that the ion itself has a 3 plus charge, the aluminum. Water is neutral. So when I put all of these waters around the aluminum, it still has a 3 plus charge. The charge didn't change. I didn't add any minuses. So here again, these are coordinate bonds. This one, one two, three, four, five, six coordinate bonds in this complex ion. A coordinate bond meaning that the water is donating both electrons. The aluminum is not donating any. And the ligand, remember, is just the Lewis base. What molecule is actually attacking the middle? It happens to be water. So the ligand in this case is H2O. And these are the coordinate bonds, and this is the central metal ion. So this is a typical way to represent complex ions. Um, a complex ion is in brackets. So that, that means that in the bracket, within the bracket, that's the entire, the central ion and all the ligands should be within the brackets. Now within the brackets, I separate the ligands by uh, using parentheses. In this case, there's six water molecules, so this would be AlH2O6, and the only reason that I need the brackets in this case is I have to put this whole thing around brackets so that I can show that there's a three plus charge on the entire species just like this, and that's what this is indicating down here. So when we are looking at the complex ion uh, formation, 
we can calculate the equilibrium constant for that. So here is a simpler example where my central metal ion is silver plus. I only have two ligands, in this case two NH3 molecules. So this will put, be put together, and I just told you these are in brackets and this one is not, so let's add the brackets there. The brackets that show that this whole compound has a plus charge on the outside of the brackets. So um, when, we are, when we represent a complex ion formation equation like this, then I have my ion plus the ligands makes the uh, complex ion. So these are all aqueous, 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 aqueous. So when I'm uh, creating my equilibrium expression, I put products over reactants. I leave out solids and liquids, but I don't have any solids and liquids. They're all aqueous. So I put this uh, product over reactants, over Ag times NH3 squared. I've got to remember to carry that uh, stoichiometric coefficient. All right, here's another example. Nickel, 2 plus, my central ion, my coordinating ion, transition metal, 6 NH3 ligands. So this will be the ligand, which is also the Lewis base. Right? This is going to donate the electrons to the N, or to the nickel, excuse me. And these uh, bonds here are all coordinate bonds because the nitrogen in NH3, remember nitrogen has two lone pair, or has one lone pair. So, well, it wouldn't be there, would it? It would be in the middle. So the nitrogen donates both of its electrons to this coordinate bond here with nickel. And the nickel has a plus two charge. The NH3 has no charge, it's neutral. Therefore, this entire complex has a two plus charge. And when I'm trying to uh, form the equilibrium expression from here. And again, we have, remember, we don't get confused by this. We have KEQ, we have KC, we have KP, we've talked about KA, KB, we talked about KSP. Now we're just adding another one, KF. And the F stands for formation, uh, uh, complex ion formation, F. And so remember the don't be confused by the little letters that are next to K. It's always K, which is always, the, we always calculate it the same way. Products over reactants. So the little letters that accompany K are supposed to help give us some more information about what it is that we're looking at, but they might just serve to make it more complicated than it needs to be. K is always K. All of these different Ks, I'm going to calculate exactly the same way, put products over reactants, and I leave out any solids or liquids. So this is the same. Here's my product. NiNH3, six, six ligands, NH3 ligands. So here's my product over this times this, raised to the sixth power, because I have six of these. So we're always going to calculate K the same way. Even this Kf, looks like they forgot the F down here. Even this KF, which is a new one, it's still just K. So if a ligand is added to a solution that forms a stronger bond than the current ligand, it will replace the current ligand. So um, the silver metal ion doesn't want to be alone in the solution. Ag plus doesn't want to float around by itself, or rather, Ag plus uh, is can form strong bonds with anything that can donate electrons to it. So if there happens to be H2O, so if there happens to be H2O within the solution, then the H2O will donate electrons to silver, and they'll float around like this complex ion. However, if I pour NH3 into that solution, and the N also has electrons, and the N might make an even stronger bond with silver than water would then this can displace the water. So there are two different complex ions. I have this complex ion formed with water, and I have this complex ion formed with ammonia. So now I have this bigger equilibrium here, where it's saying that depending on how strong H2O bonds to a silver, and depending on how strong NH3 bonds to silver, adding NH3 can displace the water so that it takes 
it takes its place, right? It substitutes the water, and H3 takes the place of the H2O. So we can affect this equilibrium by using Le Chatelier's principle. If I uh, add NH3 to the solution, adding NH3 is going to bring the equilibrium this way, by Le Chatelier's principle. So if I add NH3, that will displace the water, and I'll make more of this uh, complex ion with the ammonia. However, if I add water, even though water is not part of this equilibrium, adding water is going to uh, dilute the other species. So if I add water, it's kind of like taking away NH3 in a, because it's, making, it's diluting it. So adding water is going to move the equilibrium this way, which makes sense. If I add lots of H2O, then my silver will be complex, complexed with H2O. If I add lots of NH3, then the equilibrium moves this way, and my silver will be complexed with NH3. Here are some general formation constants. Um, when we're talking about solubility constants, they're always very small numbers. And that's, I mean, they're not always. If we're talking about a solubility constant of something that we would call soluble, then that actually has a very large KSP. But the math is not particularly interesting in that case. That's why when we looked at KSP values in this chapter, we're looking at compounds that we call insoluble. And insoluble compounds typically have very small KSP values. So KSP for insoluble compounds is very small. But look at this. KF for complex ions is always very large. In fact, sometimes it's incredibly large. Look at this one, 10 to the 35th power, 10 to the 41 power. I don't think we've seen a number that's that big yet. What that means is that, remember, K equals products over reactants. So if I have a gigantic number, right, a 1.8 with 41 zeros behind it, if I have such a gigantic number, then what it means is that in this equilibrium, Hg2 plus plus 4 Cn minus, right, here's my equilibrium. In this equilibrium, this number is so gigantic that that means that here are my reactants, and here's my product, a gigantic number means the product is far is there in far greater excess than the reactant. So that means in this equilibrium right here, I have 100% or 999999999999999 with 41 nines behind it percent product and 0.000000000000 with 41 zeros one percent of this stuff, which effectively means that there is virtually none of this left in the solution. Hg2 plus wants to form a complex ion with cyanide so strongly that if there's any Hg2 plus in the solution and any Cn minus in the solution, it's going to overwhelmingly form a complex ion. So that means the Hg2 plus, we said it doesn't want to float around by itself. In this case, because Kf is so gigantic, it wouldn't, this would be virtually undetectable. I don't think we have instruments that are capable of detecting an Hg2 plus concentration that is 0 0.000 with 41 zeros and a 1. I, I don't think we have analytical equipment that's sensitive enough to do that. So that essentially means that although, sure, this is mathematically there, it is not technically possible for us to measure it. It almost entirely exists as this complex ion. The point being, complex ion formation is incredibly favorable. If I have an ion and a ligand in the solution, it is always going to form a complex ion to a great extent, because all of these numbers are very large. So um, when we look at complex ions, they can make a different number of bonds. I can have six bonds here, there's six ligands, six coordinate bonds, six F minus ligands. 6 NH3 ligands, sit, uh, here's a mixture, H, some H2O ligands, some NH3 ligands. Um, 
so you can see that if I have different ligands, it really makes my chemical formula look pretty complicated. I have one Cu, I have four NH3s, one, two, three, four, and I have two H2Os, one, two. And the whole thing has a two plus charge, so I put it in brackets and put the two plus on the outside. So when I have six ligands in a complex, it, make, it takes this octahedral geometry, just like it did um, for, at the beginning of last term when we we're talking about the number of bonds an atom, a central atom makes. If a central atom has six bonds to it, then that is an uh, octahedral geometry. And remember, in an octahedral geometry, I have 90 degrees here, 90 degrees here, 90 degrees here, 90 degrees here. So these are all 90 degree angles, right? And then we have this one 180 degree angle. So this is just like a uh, Cartesian coordinate system. Uh, the y axis, the x axis, and the z axis. So whenever we have six ligands, we have octahedral geometry. If we have two ligands, then we have linear geometry, just like um, when I have two bonds to a, central metal, to a central atom in a Lewis structure. Two bonds want to get as far away from each other as possible, so as far away as possible is 180 degrees. So when I have two ligands, I call that a linear complex ion. It has linear geometry. Oops. If I have four ligands, then there are two different possible geometries, just like there were when we were talking about Lewis structures. Four ligands could be tetrahedral, where each bond is identical. We have 109.5 degrees between each of the bonds. Or four ligands could create a complex that is square planar, where each of the bonds are 90 degrees separated. Square planar or tetrahedral. Which of these occurs has to do with the electron configuration of the central metal ion. And we will look at that in more detail when we get to the chapter where we actually focus on these transition metals a little bit more. So how to tell the difference between tetrahedral and square planar, at this point you don't have to. But we will get there, don't worry. I'm sure you were worried. Um, so now, finally, to, to cap it all off, we've talked about KSP, which is numbers that are generally very small because we're talking about insoluble compounds. And we've talked about KF, which are generally numbers that are very large because we're talking about um, this being an incredibly favorable complex to make. So what happens if I am trying to dissolve silver chloride. I put some silver chloride in water. Let's draw a picture. I have my water here in my beaker. Just pure H2O. We try to dissolve some solid silver chloride. And this is like, um, you know, some kind of powder. And right, we got some powder over here. We put the powder in the water. And look at that, it's insoluble, it doesn't dissolve. Why is it insoluble? Because Ksp of silver chloride is about 1.8 times 10 to the negative 10. Incredibly small number, which means silver chloride is not soluble in water. It would fall to the bottom of the beaker and it would just look like powder in the bottom of the beaker. But silver plus coordinates with ammonia very favorably, 10 to the 7, and it creates this complex ion. So this is an incredibly favorable over here. This is unfavorable, which means that in this equilibrium, this number is so small, in this equilibrium, everything lies on this side of the equilibrium. And in this equilibrium, everything lies on this side of the equilibrium. So what happens if I take my... My water, it's got water, and all of my particles down here. Come on, buddy. It's really hard to click this little button. I've got all of my particles down here, silver chloride, insoluble. But then we add ammonia.
So this first equation tells me silver chloride is not going to dissolve in water because this number is very, very small, very, very insoluble. So I can calculate how much Ag plus and Cl minus there's going to be in solution. There will be a little bit, but it's going to be an incredibly small number, right? And to calculate that, I would calculate x from my ice table. So I know what's happening here, but what happens if I add NH3 to water with insoluble silver chloride in it? What do you think is going to happen? If I do have any silver plus in that solution, the silver plus is going to find the ammonia incredibly quickly and form this complex to a very large extent because that number, this number is so large, right? So remember, AgCl dissolves in water. There's a minuscule amount of this. There is a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of this in the water, right? If I add NH3, it's going to use up that Ag+. Plus. That Ag+, plus will immediately be attracted to the NH3, and I'll make this. So what's happening? If I have a little itty bitty tiny bit of silver plus in water, and then I add NH3, and that little tiny bit gets used up, well, by Le Chatelier's principle, if I'm removing Ag plus from the reaction, what does Le Chatelier's principle tell us? That the reaction's going to move forward to replace it. So I have a little bit of Ag plus in there. I add some ammonia, it removes it, it turns it into this. So then some more silver chloride dissolves, and I replace the Ag plus that was used up. But as soon as that Ag plus is formed, it's going to react with the NH3 and it's going to make this. So then it's used up. Well then, this is going to dissolve a little bit more to replace what was used up. And then it will complex with the NH3, and then this will move forward to replace what was used up, and then it will complex with the NH3, and then this will move so on and so on and so on. So you can see that if I add NH3 to this solution, it's going to cause the silver chloride to dissolve because Le Chatelier's principle is going to continuously move this reaction forward to replace all of the silver that keeps getting taken away. So, at the end, what am I going to have? Oops. I'm going to have a solution with water and A, G, N, H, 3, 2, plus. And all of the silver, oh, and Cl minus. Right, Cl minus is now in there, floating around. Because the Cl minus never went away. It was always floating around. So adding NH3, NH3 helps dissolve AgCl. So we can show that mathematically too. Now, if we look at these two equations, now we know what's happening. I put this stuff in there, it's insoluble, but it really, really likes ammonia. So if I add ammonia, it's actually going to help the whole thing dissolve. So how are we going to solve this problem a little bit more quantitatively? Remember what happens when I add two reactions together. If I want to add this chemical reaction and this chemical reaction, right, the sum of those two chemical reactions, Anytime there is a reactant and a product that are the same, they get canceled. So here I have silver plus as a reactant, and up here I have silver plus as a product. So if it appears on both sides of the equation, then it actually gets canceled out, just like in math. So if I add these two, that's the only, those are the only two in common. So now let's put down what I have. I have reactant is AgCl, solid, and I have another reactant. 2NH3, aqueous, and this is in equilibrium with uh, Cl minus, right? Here's one of my products. And my other pro, oh, and that's aqueous. And my other product is this complex ion, AgNH3, 2 plus, which is also aqueous. So when I add these two equations together, the Ag and the Ag cancel, and this is another way of saying what, I, what we just explained. AgCl is insoluble in water, but if I have AgCl solid and I add NH3, then the Ag is going to complex with the NH3 and Ag and Cl minus 
will be separated. So it will, in essence, dissolve. But it will dissolve because the Ag is, is coordinating with the NH3. So there is no Ag plus in this equation anymore because the Ag plus by itself doesn't like to float around by itself. It would rather float around with NH3. So it doesn't even exist in this equation. So when I do this to these chemical equations, then what do I do to their KFs? So this is KEQ, and I want to know how likely is this to happen? What's the equilibrium constant for this reaction? How likely is this going to happen? So KEQ for this new reaction equals KSP times KF. Well, pretty easy. 1.77 times 10 to the negative 10 times 1.7 times 10 to the 7. Gives me 3 times 10 to the negative 3. So it still is going to show that negative 3 shows that I still have more reactants than products. However, 10 to the minus 3, I'm saying how much of this is going to dissolve? Well, the, K, the new KSP when I add ammonia is 3 to the 10 to the minus 3. And before I added ammonia, it was 10 to the minus 10. So in water, AgCl is incredibly insoluble. But in NH3, AgCl is much more soluble. And we can show that by combining these two equations. So here is a visual representation, right? I've got my silver chloride down here, a bunch of powder. And um, when I add ammonia, what's going to happen is that these are the silver and the chloride are stuck together. They can't be broken apart in water. But in ammonia, the ammonia particles can drag the silver apart. See, we've, all, we've got all of these silver particles down here are being dragged away by ammonia. So now we're making all of these complex. There is no silver plus. Silver plus doesn't exist by itself. It always exists in these complex ions with ammonia. And then the Cl minus, this should be minus, Cl minus just floats around by itself, coordinating, uh, balancing the charge with this complex ion.